Welcome everyone. I am Ari Ingle, the Director of Creative Community for Peace. Thank you so much for joining us today. Creative Community for Peace is a nonprofit entertainment industry organization comprised of prominent members of the entertainment community who have come together to promote the arts as a bridge to peace, to educate about rising anti-Semitism, particularly within the entertainment industry. Uh, to learn about our work and to support our work, please visit ccfpeace.com. That is ccfpeace.com or creativecommunityforpeace.com. We are glad to have all of you today with us in our public scare once again, as we present Dispelling the Myth Season 2, a fantastic educational series of conversations with some of the leading experts on the issues and challenges facing Israel and the Jewish people today. Today's topic of discussion is what do Palestinians think? And I've really been looking forward to today's conversation for a while, uh, as I think many of us, many Jews, many supporters of Israel, many Jewish groups and organizations, don't really ever take the time to actually speak with Palestinians and understand what they do think. Uh, today's discussion is not a debate about narratives or policy, but it's really to listen and understand. Feel free to leave questions in the Q&A section of the chat, and I'll try to get to as many of them as possible towards the end of the discussion. I just ask that everyone just please leave only questions in the Q&A section. You can always just email us general comments. This week's guest is Dr. Khalil Shakaki. Dr. Shikaki is a professor of political science and director of the Palestinian Center of Policy and Survey Research in Ramallah, and is a member of the steering committee of the Arab Barometer, which is a central resource for quantitative research on the Middle East. He is also a senior fellow at the Crown Center for Middle East Studies at Brandeis University. His most recent publication is Arabs and Israelis, Conflict and Peacemaking in the Middle East. He received his PhD from Columbia University and is preeminent polling leader working in the West Bank today. Welcome, Khalil. Thank you, Ari. Good to be with you. Um, to kick things off, can you just give us a little background on yourself? How did you decide to get into polling? Um, and and what, what urged you to sort of get into this line of business? And did proper polling even exist before you started your work? In Palestine, unfortunately not. And the reason I got involved in it is, is because I wanted to understand Palestinian domestic politics. And I discovered uh, there was uh, almost nothing there in terms of evidence. Uh, people had their own narrative and people studied the history, um, but I was a political scientist and I wanted to understand behavior and how attitudes are shaped and what drives them and so on. And um, in the absence of any kind of evidence that one can rely on, uh, I wasn't about to start teaching uh, my students my own narrative, and so I decided there was a need uh, for us to understand what is going out there by actually collecting data and, and understanding our own people. So this is all started uh, this is almost exactly 30 years ago is when we first started to conduct surveys in the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. Right. And, and I mean, it's extremely important work, I think, understanding what the perspective is of the people. Um, can you give us a little more background on how your polls are conducted and how willing people are to participate? Uh, very good question. Things have evolved over time, um, but most importantly, these surveys are conducted face to face inside homes. So we essentially begin by selecting areas randomly selecting areas. Uh, fortunately, uh, th there is a great deal of data, so we can rely on the data by the Palestinian Central Bureau of Statistics. Before the creation of the Palestinian Authority, we relied on the Israeli Central Bureau of Statistics for the right. data on Palestinians. And the, over time, the Central Bureau uh, in Ramallah was also able to develop maps for every location uh, throughout the West Bank, Gaza, and we have used this data uh, to randomly select locations or localities, and uh, inside the localities, we determine which home by uh, a, a simple random selection, and uh, inside the house hall, we select one adult uh, for the interview using something called the quiche table. So we essentially follow uh, scientific rules that allow us to pick an individual with a say with a, a particular age mm -hmm. uh, inside the household in order to ensure that our sample is representative of all Palestinians. 
Right. And you mentioned, so you, this is West Bank and Gaza. Are there any issues with uh, dealing with Gaza? I'm sure, assuming it's a little bit more difficult than the West Bank. Uh, it is a little bit more difficult than the West Bank, but there are problems in both locations in terms of our ability to freely conduct survey, it, it surveys. It is easier in the West Bank, no doubt about that. Um, but the truth is we have never been, a, been stopped from doing surveys in either location, uh, the, despite the attempts occasionally by this side or that side to hamper our efforts. People are willing to, you asked earlier about this, people are willing to talk. In fact, people, uh, our rejection rate is one of the lowest in the world. Our mm. rejection rate today on average is 8%. With, for house to house uh, interviews, this is marvelous to have this kind of uh, response rate. Uh, and we do find from our data collectors when we brief them, debrief them that they are indeed, they feel that people want to talk. And this is an opportunity. Of course, keep in mind that here in the West Bank and, and Gaza and in East Jerusalem, uh, the last time we had elections was in 2006. And so people do want to express their views and, and do feel that um, by agreeing to be part of the surveys, uh, they are helping to express the views of other Palestinians. Right, right. I can imagine in America, the rate is probably far uh, greater than 8% of people turning things sure. down. I'm um, switching to the actual polls um, themselves, because I know there's a lot to cover today. Um, and we'll get into some more of the details later. But in just in general terms, what do Palestinians prioritize most? For instance, in America, a new Pew survey said that Americans' top priority was the economy, then next healthcare, then combating terrorism, um, then reducing crime. So what does it look like for Palestinians? Uh, overall, there's one thing where Gazans and West Bankers would agree on, and that is uh, to get rid of the Israeli occupation. This is number one in defining problems and goals. This is um, by far the most important and where the two sides agree. However, when we get to the second and, and, and third priorities or issues that people care about, Gaza will differ from the West Bank. Gaza uh, is most importantly focused on improving economic conditions combating poverty, uh, unemployment, and so on. In the West Bank, it will be corruption and governance issues that will be more important uh, than economic issues. Economic issues will come as, as number three. Um, th there are, of course, other issues, and here too, Gazans and West Bankers will differ. Uh, for Gazans, reunification of the West Bank and Gaza, ending the siege and blockade over Gaza right. is a lot more important than it is for the West Bank where there is need for greater security. There are threats here, uh, local threats, uh, as the Palestinian Authority's ability to deploy police forces uh, in various locations throughout the West Bank is hampered by various rules and regulations and by settler violence. So West Bankers are more interested in security uh, and Gazans will tend to want uh, to end the siege and blockade. Right, makes sense. Um, one data point that I check most often uh, when I'm looking at your polls is solving the, com the conflict and the preferred outcomes. Um, starting with the two-state solution, uh, support for the two-state solution has dropped among Palestinians, I saw from 43% in September 2020 to around 33% this year. Um, it still has a plurality out of all the solutions, but what can you tell us about Palestinians' view on the two-state solution? 30 years ago, when we first started to conduct these surveys, 80% of the Palestinians wow. were in favor of the two-state solution. Even during the worst days of the second intifada between 2000 and 2005, by the time we ended the second intifada, the support for the two-state solution was still very high, more than 60%. Wow. Uh, in the last five years, there has been significant acceleration and the decline in the support, but it really started more than 10 years ago to see a decline in support for the two-state solution. The most, uh, in the, the, the clearest sign of why this is happening uh, has to do with the perception of lack of feasibility. The perception that Israeli settlement expansion throughout the West Bank um, makes it impossible to separate the two communities into two separate states. 
And that uh, as people come to this conclusion, and today 70% of the Palestinians actually believe in that, uh, they come, they, they soon after that change their attitude from supporting the two-state solution to opposing it. Uh, for the youth, in particular, in fact, the plurality supports something else. It does not support the two-state solution mm -hmm. anymore. The support among the youth, here the youth, 18 to 29 years of age, the, 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 the support is mostly for a one-state solution with equal rights, Israeli Jews and Palestinians living in a single state between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea. This today is where a plurality, it's not a majority, but a plurality of young, uh, of, of all young Palestinians, the more educated, the more likely they will be in favor of a one-state solution with equal rights. Right. You know, and that actually brings me to our next question, which I think is interesting, um, just staying on the two-state solution, and maybe that's sort of the answer. But in a recent poll you did, you put forth a package and you asked people to respond. And I just want people to hear what that package was. Um, so it was a demilitarized Palestinian state, an Israeli withdrawal to the Green Line with equal territorial exchanges, family unification in Israel of 100,000 Palestinian refugees, West Jerusalem is the capital of Israel and East Jerusalem is the capital of Palestine, the Jewish quarter in the Western Wall under Israeli sovereignty, and the Muslim and Christian quarters and the Temple Mount under Palestinian sovereignty. Israeli and the future Palestinian state would both be democratic. The bilateral agreement will be part of a larger peace agreement with all the Arab states. The US and major Arab countries will ensure full implementation of the agreement by both sides and the end of the conflict and claim. So according to your poll, 72% of Palestinians were opposed to this two-state comprehensive package. If this was really put on the table, do you think Palestinians would reject it? Or do you think, you know, right now, this, this is more to do with the conflict and what's going on, um, and, and that's the reason why? This is a very good question. Uh, I actually think that if this becomes a reality, and there is indeed, a package along these lines that a majority of the Palestinians will support it. So why do I say that? Well, because in 2008, this package in these details was first presented to Palestinians and Israelis, by the way, we, because since 2000, we have been conducting joint Israeli-Palestinian surveys. And this package that you have just read uh, was presented to both sides. And we started to do so in 2008 and just around this time when the former uh, Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Olmert and the current Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas were negotiating uh, as part of the Annapolis process, uh, a permanent agreement. So these terms uh, were asked in 2008. And after that, of course, we continued to ask. Uh, and in 2008, two thirds of the Palestinians said yes to this package. Today, the level of support for this package is way less than one third. And so mm -hmm. there has been dramatic uh, hardening of attitudes. Now, the, hard, the reason I think uh, if this package becomes a reality today, uh, attitudes will change and will embrace it is because we don't see the current change being driven, the hardening of attitudes being driven by changes in values. There really hasn't been a great deal of change in terms of values uh, among Palestinians. Uh, rather, this change is the outcome of experience, uh, living conditions, uh, exposure to violence, exposure to, to hardships, and the evolving perception that there is no partner on the, on the other side. These are, of course, are the same drivers for Israeli Jews who, whom we have also seen the same decline in support for this package uh, throughout these years. Uh, Israelis and Palestinians are basically exposed to the same experiences right. and they respond to these experiences almost in an identical manner. They become more hardline as they are more uh, exposed to violence or more exposed to hardships. And um, it, therefore, as long as that is the case, as long as the change is not driven by changes in values, I would uh, be, uh, well, I would say I'm more optimistic right. uh, that uh, this can be reversed. 
when we begin to see changes that are driven by values and ideology, this becomes a lot more difficult uh, for us to, for us, I mean, for policymakers uh, to reverse. Right now, I don't see ideology and values becoming so different from where they were before. There mm -hmm. has been some change, but, but not dramatic enough to destroy the, the feasibility of the solution. Right. Well, that's good to it's good to know and good to hear. And yes, hopefully uh, we never get to that point where um, the values do change. Um, just digging into the other options, you mentioned one state solution a little bit. Can you just tell us a little more where the numbers on that have been historically, where they stand now? And just to clarify, wh whenever I look at the one state polls, usually, um, and what Israelis may some Israelis view as that that support the one state, what they view, and what Palestinians when they support the one state, what they view. Sometimes it, it really differs, and it's not necessarily one vote, one person, one vote, and not necessarily democracy for all. Sometimes it's one state with you know either the Jews controlling or one state, but the Palestinians are in charge because the right of return makes it that way, and and that's uh, the reality now. So what do you what are they what are the numbers on this, and where do you think people really believe when you hear this? Uh, one state solution? There are various ways of understanding the one state solution among Palestinians. There are those who are Islamist, having Islamist values, right. who, to whom the one state solution is all of Palestine is Arab and Muslim. Jews right. can live there, but they uh, do not necessarily uh, have equal rights. Uh, mm -hmm. the, there is a second version that is more secular but is pretty much similar where uh, the, the, there is one state, but there is a, a, a Palestinian majority and where Israeli Jews may not necessarily have equal rights. When I say one state solution is supported by a plurality of Palestinian youth, I do not mean any of those. I mean a third uh, version of one state solution where Israeli Jews and Palestinians have equal rights. This version uh, is, is one that did not really exist, exist until the middle of the second intifada, where we started to see a little bit of a decline in support for the two-state solution from the 80% that I mentioned earlier to about 70, 75, as, uh, and then later to 60%. By this time, those who have started to abandon the two-state solution shifted to supporting this one state solution with equal rights. Um, th this support for uh, a one person, one vote or uh, a binational state. So some of those who supported this idea um, didn't want to completely abandon nationhood. They didn't completely want to abandon their national identity and, and thought that uh, a binational state rather than a unitary state with the one person one vote uh, would be more appropriate for given the nature of the conflict and, and the, the makeup of the population. Um, we don't see a lot of talk these days about a binational state. We see more interest in equal rights uh, regardless. Um, and and uh, the idea of a unitary state seem to be the dominant idea that we hear among Palestinian youth these days. And, and what's the number if you're not just counting youth, counting you know, the whole population, because you know, there's, a, there's a lot of other people there. Uh, when we first discovered that there was a shift in attitudes, uh, it was less than 20%. And this would be the middle of the second intifada. Um, today, it is about one third, although it, the, there are variations from time to time, depending on what is happening on the ground. But overall, and our last figure is, is less than a third, but I would say there is a third of the Palestinians who are willing to embrace a one state solution with equal rights today. Uh, and if the idea becomes more popular and if there are factions or leaders who are willing to support it, this idea could actually gain significant momentum um, over time. Um, right. So one third is where we are today. Um, I, I would say that among the youth, this could be um, slightly over 40%, maybe closer to 45%. 
And it could also go higher among this particular group. This particular group, in addition to the perception of other Palestinians who feel that the two-state solution is no longer feasible, uh, feels very strongly that a, a future Palestinian state it could be similar to the current Palestinian authority, corrupt and authoritarian. That is the prevailing perception today among the overwhelming majority of the Palestinians, but among the youth in particular, where there is a much greater level of discontent and, and, and anger with the Palestinian leadership, uh, the, the, um, the perception that the Palestinian authority is corrupt and authoritarian is much higher. And this turns out to be one of the reasons why youth uh, do not want uh, sovereignty and independence for Palestinians and would mm -hmm. rather have one single state with equal rights. Right, interesting. Um, and then just to talk about confederation, I, I don't know if that's as similar as, as binational. So confederation, I I, when I think of it as something, some loosely joined state between the Palestinians, uh, Palestinian state, Israeli state, something that maybe looks like the EU, um, I see in your polling support for confederation is mostly going downward trajectory since 2016. Uh, what are the reasons behind this and where does it stand today? The decline in support for the confederation is also reflecting this overall hardening of attitudes and the declining or the increasing level of distrust that we see. The level of distrust is is gaining momentum on both sides. Uh, the belief that the other side is not trustworthy is poisoning the atmosphere on both sides regarding any kind of solution, not just the two-state solution. And the confederation idea is one of those solutions where uh, we have seen a significant drop. There was a time in the past where the support level was a little higher than one third. And now it has declined to uh, less than a quarter. And that, I would say, is something that could also gain momentum if it becomes realistic. Right. Uh, right now, in addition to the distrust and the belief that there is no partner on the other side, there is this perception that this is not real. It's not going to happen. Don't right. you see what's going on? And so that uh, creates a level of well, you can say pessimism, that, but, but this one is, is one that actually drives attitudes and, and make people less willing to support ideas, even if they thought that these ideas are good ones. Right. Um, so moving on a little bit. So Palestinian President Abbas uh, recently addressed the Arab League conference in Cairo, and he repeated a claim that there was no connection between the Jews in Jerusalem, as well as the Western Wall and the Temple Mount. Um, in your recent poll, you found that 93% of Palestinians see themselves as the rightful owners of the land between the Jordan and the sea. Um, the same number negates that Jews have any claim to the land. Do Palestinians really believe Jews are a foreign body to the Middle East? And is that something that is being taught in schools? Or is this, once again, more in line with the views as we're at war, let's just not give an inch and deny any claim? Um, it is not something that is taught at schools, and to the contrary, Palestinians know their history, and they know they have lived with Jews for centuries. Right. Uh, that is not the point. I think what is uh, being said here is about who has exclusive rights. Both sides, the survey you are referring to, of course, is a joint survey. And so both right. sides, Israeli Jews and Palestinians, equally believe that they have exclusive right to the land. And of course, when Abbas speaks to the, to the Arab League, he isn't talking about history. He isn't really talking about history. He is talking about international law. And he is essentially saying, according to international law, Jerusalem and the West Bank are uh, occupied territories. The, the, the idea that you have historic links or culture or religion uh, having a superior uh, authority over international law is what Abbas is essentially denying. Uh, but as uh, other leaders in, in this conflict, of course, um, the, the, the effort to emphasize the point sometimes leads them to make statements, even if, when they know that these statements right. are incorrect. But the, the point, the emphasis that they are making 
of course, is that international law does not recognize this history or these connections. Uh, one can, if, if and when the, the conflict is, is resolved, of course, all these claims uh, would certainly um, be no longer um, either relevant or useful uh, for Israeli-Palestinian relations. Right. So it's more digging into each side, sort of digging into their narrative to for, you know, for political aims and uh, to claim the moral high ground and international legal, I guess, high ground. Um, so 90 uh, percent of Palestinians also believe that their victimhood status entitles them uh, to do whatever is necessary to vibe, including armed struggle. Um, in yes. your opinion, do you think there will be a third intifada soon? Um, and if if you do, do you think what is the feeling among Palestinians that they could possibly defeat Israel militarily, or is it there's no other option and and you know intifada is the only solution for them? Right now, we do see significant rise in support for armed struggle, violence, and we do see uh, a rising perception that violence pays, and that the Israelis understand nothing but the language of force and so on. Again, by the way, this is also paralleled uh, by similar increases among Israeli Jews right. in favor of military solutions to the conflict with Palestinians. So it reflects uh, this important hardening of attitudes that we see among both communities uh, in recent years. Does that mean that a third intifada is about to erupt? The answer is no. Uh, an intifada isn't just about perceptions. It is also about uh, who is uh, who who is in authority. Is the Palestinian Authority the leadership and the Palestinian Security Services uh, are going to allow this to, to to take place, or are they fighting it? Right now, they are fighting it. Uh, the attitude of the Palestinian Authority is completely against any resort to violence. The Palestinian Security Services. Uh, today are strong enough to be able to prevent any expression of an intifada. However, the Palestinian Authority is becoming weaker. It is, it is becoming weaker because it has no electoral legitimacy. It is, it is losing the trust of the people. Uh, today, uh, just around a quarter of the Palestinians are willing to trust it. Uh, three quarters of the Palestinians want the Palestinian president to resign. Um, the legitimacy question uh, is one major reason why the Palestinian Authority is becoming weaker. It is giving young kids uh, the, the, the empowerment they need to, to challenge the Palestinian Authority, establish armed groups in places like Janine and Nablus, um, and, and um, in challenging the, Palestine, uh, the authorities' ability to, to, to have monopoly over coercive force, the Palestinian Authority is weakened even further. Uh, of course, the Israelis do weaken the Palestinian Authority, uh, whether it is by the incursions that Israel is carrying out daily. Today, 10 people died in Nablus, for example. Well, this does tremendous damage to the Palestinian Authority because more and more people will view the Palestinian Authority as collaborator. The Israeli mm -hmm. army was able to enter Nablus uh, at, at a time when the Palestinian Authority says there is no security coordination of the Israelis, but people saw how dozens of Israeli military vehicles uh, were passing through Nablus with, uh, without a single Palestinian policeman raising a finger. This uh, is going to, to, to give more Palestinians uh, a perception that the Palestinian Authority cannot be relied on. This questioning of the legitimacy and credibility of the Palestinian Authority will give rise to greater interest in forming groups such as those that we see in the northern part of the West Bank. Right. This is something uh, is that, that is likely to, to accelerate as the Palestinian Authority becomes weaker, as it does, as it becomes so, it leaves a vacuum behind. This vacuum is filled by um, these young kids. Mm -hmm. Do they believe that they can defeat the state of Israel militarily? Of course not. They, all they want to do is to express their anger, the, the, the desire for revenge, for what happened to their friends and colleagues, uh, to deter the Israelis from entering Palestinian areas, 
to impose costs on the Israeli continued occupation. This is the prevailing perception, particularly among the youth, that the Israelis are happy with the status quo. Therefore, occupation is permanent unless we impose costs, increase the level of pain and suffering of the Israelis, then they will begin to reconsider what they are doing. And at that point, perhaps negotiations can start. Right. And then what Khalil is referring to is groups like the Lions Den, which are cropping up that aren't necessarily affiliated with one of the existing groups like Hamas or Islamic Jihad or, or Fatah. Um, and how does corruption play into that, though? I, I'm assuming some of that, you know, faith in the PA is lost, I'm, I'm assuming, because they deem them to be so corrupt, right? Or is, or is it more just losing faith because of what you just described? Corruption is absolutely critical. Um, because people come to the conclusion that the Palestinian Authority elite and leaders are corrupt and therefore are serving their own personal right. interests uh, rather than the interests of the Palestinian people. That the reason why the Palestinian police, for example, today didn't stand up to the Israeli army as Nablus, not what the Palestinian Authority says is that they didn't want to, mass to massacre the police because they, the police is not a challenge to the Israeli army, but rather because they want to stay uh, as leaders, as, as the elite, as official senior officials in the Palestinian Authority benefiting from their senior positions and that they don't care if this leads to a, a permanent occupation. The perception that this is this corruption, this is a political corruption in people's eyes. It's not just corruption in the sense uh, of financial corruption uh, or something similar to that, but rather the, the, an elite that is essentially working to empower itself and enrich itself at the expense of the Palestinian people. And mm -hmm. that uh, therefore, unless we challenge it, unless we uh, uh, are willing to take steps uh, to reduce its influence and control over the Palestinians, uh, we will be uh, essentially allowing this elite uh, to lead us uh, to nowhere as occupation will become indeed permanent. Right. And I, th I think as you, as you sort of laid out, the Palestinian Authority probably has the most to lose with the Third Intifada. Um, and speaking of Abbas, he is in the 18th year of a four-year term. Um, he's 88 years old. What do you think happens in the West Bank when he passes? Is it total chaos or is that a way for that to be prevented? Well, anarchy and chaos is certainly things that uh, would most likely be in the future uh, if Abbas is to leave the scene under conditions that are similar to the prevailing, the ones prevailing today. Uh, of course, if he is to disappear at uh, a time when things are worse than conditions are today, it will be more than anarchy. There could be open violence and internal strife among Palestinians. Um, this is not, however, to uh, completely rule out the possibility that in the absence of Abbas, um, both the two large political factions, Farah and Hamas, might be able to come together and, and do reach a, a, some sort of a compromise that could allow for a, a temporary arrangement to be followed, say, six months later by holding elections in the West Bank and Gaza. This is not something that should be completely ruled out. I think it is right now improbable, uh, and that most likely what we will see is, is, is more of anarchy, perhaps some level of violence, um, not open violence, I would say, unless the Palestinian Authority, by the time he leaves, has become so weak that the security uh, services uh, are unable to act professionally or to be able to ensure uh, rule of law and, and so on. Um, all these are possibilities. Right now, I, I tend to believe there isn't likely to be a great deal of violence, but there could be some. Right. But most importantly, that we will be facing anarchy. Right. And, and when Abbas does pass away, or even now, actually, or now and when he passes, who is um, the preferred libel? Is it Marwan Barghouti, who is in prison? 
Is it a leader from Hamas, like Ishmael Hania or Vlad Mashal? Is it Hussein al-Sheikh, who has the PLO behind Abbas? Um, and I've even heard some people say that maybe it'll break down in tribal lines and maybe there's some sort of UAE sort of thing that eventually emerges. So, so what do you think, how does it shake out and who do you think is the most popular leader right now? Uh, a very good question. Nobody knows, of course, the answer right. to that. If we are to go by what the public wants, it is Baruti. No doubt he is the most popular Palestinian leader today. If, if elections are held today, there is absolutely no doubt that he would win these elections. Um, uh, Hamas' most popular figure is Ismail Aniya. He is Hamas leader, official Hamas leader. Uh, people like him because they, and, and including people who do not support Hamas, they like him because they see him as, as someone with an open mind uh, and relatively moderate uh, leader of Hamas. <laughs> Now, if it if it is up if it is not up to the to the Palestinian people to decide, and and rather up to Abbas to determine now who will um, be next in line, he is probably going to go with Hussein Sheikh. He is the one who promoted him to the yeah. current position. The president trusts Hussein Sheikh. Hussein Sheikh and the president seem to think alike about things, and and the president has a great deal of trust in him. So obviously this would be the way to go for him. Uh, unfortunately for Hussein Sheikh, uh, his own colleagues at the Fatah Central Committee do not share the enthusiasm of the president for him. And so it, what one can logically ask what if, if the president is no longer there, uh, would, would Hussein Sheikh colleagues allow him uh, to, to remain in that uh, senior position. Right. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. Uh, there is likely to be internal conflict within Farah that may or may not involve use of force to determine who will be uh, the, the, the next president. Um, there, there is one reason why we have all these questions and that is the lack of institutional and constitutional uh, Clarity, given the changes that have been introduced into the political system during the last decade by the current president. And, and so also think along those same lines, who do Palestinians, particularly in the West Bank, I think, have the most loyalty to? Is it, you know, if you had to rank it in order, was it, is it their tribe, their family? Is it a group like Fatah, Hamas? Is it the Palestinian people as a whole? Where do you think their loyalties lie first and foremost? It depends on what uh, the issue is about. If this is about, say, local elections and you want to vote in your locality and your locality is a rural area, uh, then family and tribe are uh, indeed very, very important. Not necessarily the most dominant force, but a significantly important force. Um, usually political parties uh, and, and groups with ideologies and, and so on uh, try to make peace with families and tribes uh, in these rural areas. So we could see a combination of political parties and tribes and, and families uh, making deals in rural areas in the West Bank. In cities uh, and big towns, this is not feasible. Uh, tribes and, and families are too small to really have that kind of influence. And when it comes to national issues, na essentially issues of elections for a parliament or a president, for example, uh, tribes and families are, are essentially irrelevant. Uh, they, might have they might have had influence in the past right. when the electoral system was uh, based on districts and so in small districts, you could say tribes and families could create alliances and coalitions and, and join and, and, and compete in these elections uh, in order to improve uh, their conditions. Um, these days, of course, our electoral system has changed and it is now proportional representation, the same as it is in Israel. So localities and regions are really irrelevant. And you know, for, for a long time, in all issues of national interest, uh, it, uh, the, the most dominant 
driver has been uh, the, the either a nationalist party like Fatah or an Islamist party like Hamas. Mm -hmm. In the elections in 2006, the last time Palestinians had elections, that is parliamentary elections, 85% uh, of the Palestinians voted for one of these two parties. Right. Um, and as someone actually asked here uh, in the questions, and I just have a few of my own, but we'll go to one of the, the, the questions asked here is, do you think Hamas, if they were to come to power, would ever make peace with Israel since they've stated that they would never accept a peace with Israel or uh, even a one state solution with Israel? It is difficult to conceive how Hamas would come to power under current conditions. Given the changes in our electoral system, Hamas could not have won and could not have um, formed a, a, the government in 2006 had the electoral system been similar to the one that we currently have. Um, nonetheless, uh, assuming that uh, Hamas does come to power, uh, would Hamas be willing to make peace with Israel? Uh, the answer is immediately, I don't think that is right. feasible. But I think in the long run, the answer is yes. We, we have seen um, Islamist political parties in the region, in various countries in the region, uh, were, were willing to talk to the Israelis and, and make peace with Israel. Uh, and that applies to the, the one year in which um, the, the Muslim brothers uh, had a president in Egypt and he certainly was willing to continue to abide by the peace treaty. And we have seen in the past uh, among Palestinian Islamists more and more willingness. I'm talking about the leaders. This is not something that Hamas embraced uh, at, a, at a popular level or, or, or publicly. Uh, the, uh, the, the willingness to discuss the two-state solution and to come as close as possible to the idea of a two-state solution. They have never openly embraced a two-state solution, but they did come very close to accepting in fact, endorsing uh, uh, the creation of a Palestinian state along the lines of the 1967 lines. And that is certainly just one step away from endorsing a two-state solution. Right. And I think I saw in one of your recent polls that the people in Gaza um, have replaced the West Bank in the area that is a little bit more moderate in their views, which I thought was interesting. Um, so shifting gears a little bit, what are people's views on the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement? Um, I've heard some claim that the people in the West Bank largely don't even know what it really is, um, and others claim that essentially everyone just in general supports boycotting Israel, even if they don't know what the BDS movement is. Uh, what are the views on this? Well, for Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza, uh, the idea is, as a tool to pressure Israel is totally acceptable. Nonetheless, if you're asking, do Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza want to themselves to practice BDS? The answer is no, of course not. Uh, to the contrary, they want to work in Israel. They want right. to do business with Israel. They, they live under Israeli occupation. They don't believe that they have the luxury of boycotting Israel. They have to... If, if, if Israel says we have an opening for a thousand jobs in the Israeli labor market, a hundred thousand Palestinians will apply for that. Well, does that mean that these a hundred thousand Palestinians are opposed to you boycotting Israel? The answer, of course not. They are not opposed to you boycotting Israel, but they themselves don't think that this should apply to them. Right. But and is there a sense though of like a formal BDS movement and a, a knowledge of, of what it actually is and what it's doing and support for it, or is it once again more generally like yes we we would love for everybody to sort of boycott Israel internationally, but we don't really know what this boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement, you know, is. Yes, most Palestinians don't know what it is except for the elite and the right. educated. 
the more educated people are, the more they are aware of the movement and the more they are likely to support it. So there is uh, a, and of course, this applies to all Palestinian universities. There is a very, very strong boycott movement in all Palestinian universities. And uh, this applies, of course, to, to both the staff as, as well as the students. So the, the, the active or or politicized communities uh, and, and in the universities in particular, you, you could see this very clearly. Uh, there is indeed significant awareness uh, and, uh, and support for the movement. Right, so it's a more academic level um, and intelli intelligentsia level, I guess. Um, and one thing that's sort of along the same lines, only 13% of Palestinians are willing to participate in workshops that bring both sides together, I saw. Um, uh, so uh, this yeah. time, this, this is very good news. The, the, yeah. the fact that you can still find 13% today who are willing to participate, given this absolutely horrendous environment in which they live, uh, this is really significant uh, development. Uh, but it does indeed uh, mean that this is way much less than what we found uh, in the past, even just two years ago. There, there is no doubt that this idea that, that we don't want to talk and we don't want to explain our cause and we don't right. want to engage uh, is of course related to this perception that this is normalization of relations with the Israeli occupation. Right, I mean, and it, to me it's troubling because right, how can the two sides possibly come together if there's no willingness among the people to even start talking um, and having some of these conversations. But, and is it more that there's pressure not to do it or just an unwillingness to not even, right, discuss each other's narratives? It is difficult to tell what exactly is driving the increased level of rejection of dialogue uh, that we certainly did see previously. Even during the second intifada, the level of willingness to engage in dialogue with Israelis uh, was way higher than it is uh, uh, in, in our last survey, which is very low as, as you have indicated. Right. Um, but it does say something about the importance of changing these conditions that are so oppressive that they in fact create this kind of uh, either fear uh, or, or belief that this is something that uh, one shouldn't do because other Palestinians will view it negatively, that this is the right uh, way to, to, to behave. Although it might be part of that, uh, but I think the overall uh, the conditions that, that create distrust uh, is probably the, a better explanation for it. Right, right. Um, shifting to the right of return, which I know many Palestinians hold sacred, um, you got in a little bit of hot water several years ago when polling on this subject. Um, I certainly don't want to cause you any trouble, but what can you tell us about the, you know, in terms of the Palestinians view on this topic? The right, the, the refugee issue is made up of various aspects. One of them is the right of return. So to resolve the refugee issue, Israelis and Palestinians must resolve this issue of whether refugees have a right to return in principle. What is sacred to Palestinians is the principle that there must be a recognition that refugees have a right to return. What happens after that is something where we see or we saw in the past. Today, we don't see a, a greater flexibility, uh, but in the past, we did see significant flexibility among Palestinians regarding what happens if and when the right of return is recognized. Uh, the survey that you were referring to uh, found that very few Palestinians want to return uh, right. to live in what, in, to the, back to their homes and properties, which is now Israel. We found very few Palestinians willing to do that. Overwhelming majority of Palestinian refugees when given the right of return and asked, now you have the right to return. Tell us, where would you take your family? Right. The overwhelming majority said they will take their family to live in the Palestinian state or alternatively stay if they are in a host country, stay in the host country. Uh, so that was the most surprising finding because in the past when addressing the refugee question, 
our focus was just on the right, on the principle of the right of return. And of course, 95% of refugees don't want to give up the right of return. This is why it is a considered sacred, mm -hmm. uh, because of this consensus around it. Uh, it but but the, the practical question that we asked, what would happen after you have the right of return? Where would you go? Where, where would you take your family? This was a very different question, and it was the first time that we've asked that question. And the findings were certainly very, very surprising to us. Has things changed since then? I would say yes, and attitudes have hardened. However, I really don't know. I don't know whether we would still get the same answers that we have received. This was almost 20 years ago. So right. we, I, I don't know whether uh, this is the, the, the attitudes of, of refugees. This survey was con actually conducted just among refugees. Um, and, and so, but nonetheless, I would still say that this distinction between the principle of the right of return and the actual implementation of the right of return are two distinct idea, um, items in a refugee solution that must be kept uh, distinct and separated and negotiated separately. Right. And I know some people uh, in the chat were talking about whether a right exists. And, and uh, yeah, this conversation really isn't getting into the back and forth on that issue, it's more just understanding, you know, the Palestinians view on how they hold the right of return. Now going to some other questions. Uh, here's one. Would Palestinians ever accept a state where the settlers remain as its citizens? So can Jews be uh, citizens of a Palestinian state in the West Bank? Is that ever thought of or polled about as a solution? Yes. Uh, in fact, um, in the late 90s, actually, we started this in the mid 90s. This is a long time ago. This is soon after the Oslo process. Um, we did uh, surveys uh, in which we asked Palestinians uh, about the right of settlers, given the Jew Israeli Jewish settlers who live in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, if they want to stay and live in the Palestinian state if it comes, if uh, this area becomes um, the state of Palestine. And we asked Palestinians uh, whether this would be a solution that would be acceptable to them if these settlers uh, abide by Palestinian laws, whether they are Israeli citizens right. or Palestinian citizens. And there was a great deal of flexibility among Palestinians. Among Israeli Jewish settlers, we only found perhaps about 20% who said they would be willing to live in the Palestinian state. I, we haven't asked since then, but my guess is probably less than that is what we would find today. Among Palestinians, however, we did find significant minority, not a majority, that was in favor of settlers remaining in the Palestinian state uh, after a peace agreement is reached. Uh, the majority back then, but it was a slim majority, opposed it. Today, in the, I don't remember when was the last time we asked about it, but we did ask about it sometime in the last five years. And we found that uh, the large minority we had of Palestinians willing to support that has gone down considerably. So. I would say probably one in five today uh, right. among Palestinians would support that idea. Right. Um, here's another question, and we'll just do two more because um, we're almost at the time. Uh, this is regarding Russia and America. When Abbas recently met with Putin, he stated he doesn't trust America, but that Russia stands by the Palestinian people, justice and international law. Um, do the Palestinian people support this view? Do they prefer Russia over America? Is that how they feel as well or no? Uh, to some extent, yes, uh, but this is a rhetoric, of course, you shouldn't take that uh, seriously. Right. Um, Abbas would never uh, <clears throat> would never replace the US with Russia. If you think for a minute that Abbas was serious about what he was talking, you really don't understand Palestinian politics or the Palestinian-Israeli relations. It, it is the American support that helps build the Palestinian Authority and the Palestinian Security Services. And right. Abbas realizes this more than anybody else. And he would never bargain away um, this US support. Why, why does he make those sorts of statements, though? Understanding uh, that? Uh, well, because he can get away with it. 
Uh, and of course, uh, he was speaking uh, at a time when the Russians <clears throat> were standing with the Palestinians. The Russians have been, the, the position of Russia has been wholeheartedly supporting all Palestinians in the UN Security Council right. and in general statements that the Russians um, have been making. And the Palestinian Authority has come under a, a lot of pressure after the uh, Russian invasion uh, of Ukraine uh, to take a stand against the Russians. And the, of course, in fact, uh, a, a plurality of the Palestinians did exactly that. In our surveys, we found that uh, there was, uh, uh, most of the Palestinians did condemn the Russian invasion uh, and, and considered their presence in uh, Ukraine to be a, an occupation, uh, a military occupation. And uh, this percentage in fact has increased over time rather than decreased. So <clears throat> among the Palestinian public, there is a realization uh, <clears throat> that what is going on is a, a military invasion of a neighboring country. Right. And for most Palestinians, this is not very different from where they, the, their own situation. Um, but of course, for Abbas, uh, it, it's a different story, and it's it's about uh, wanting to um, to have the continued political support from Russia that he, he is currently enjoying. Right, playing plain politics. Um, so one last question. Uh, this is a pretty interesting one to end it off. And I think in the Middle East, the Arab world doesn't have many democracies, perhaps maybe Iraq, which is a very young democracy, the only other one, uh, the only one. What are the Palestinians' view on democracy? Um, are they okay with, say, a king or a strong man like Arafat or a small group of leaders like that are in the Hamas um, that are picked by, you know, a Hamas elite ruling them, or do they want democracy? Well, a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, in recent years, we have seen more and more Palestinians uh, in favor of a strong, <clears throat> a strong leader. Nonetheless, uh, the, 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 there is absolutely no doubt that uh, at least two thirds of the Palestinians today prefer to have a democracy and a liberal democracy at that. Although in some social values, the Palestinians tend to be conservative, but overall, most Palestinians um, have traditionally been supporting democracies <clears throat> and preferring a democracy. They understand what a democracy is. They know that they don't have one and when asked whether they want one, the answer is certainly in favor. Uh, and when we go over the various liberal values of democracy, we do in, indeed find um, that at least 60%, if not more of the Palestinians are willing to support various liberal democracies, <clears throat> various liberal values. Uh, and I'm, I'm not just talking about elections uh, or um, like LGBTQ rights, rights, women's rights, rights, things like that? Women's rights is where we get into the social values and right. where we be, where the level of support is likely to go down. Among the youth in particular, you will find, by the way, the youth are the most liberal in our society and the demand for democracy among Palestinian youth is, is the highest. And where you would find, in fact, uh, a majority of Palestinians who would say, Men, men uh, do not necessarily make uh, the uh, women can be as uh, good political leaders as men. Uh, mm. Older people are not likely to agree with that, but younger Palestinian male Palestinians are likely to agree with that. Great. Well, it's good to hear that the youth are. Uh... The youth are, are, are becoming more uh, liberal in their views. Um, that seems to always be the case. But thank you so much for joining us today. We are at the time. Um, can you please let everybody know where they can find your work and if you're on social media, where they can find you on social media? Uh, sure. Uh, they can find me on Twitter at, uh, at Keishikaki. And they can find our website, which is pcpsr.org. Uh, and... Uh, all of our publications can be found there. Great, and I will make sure to uh, that we email those links out when we send a, an email for everyone that attended. Um, 
So thank you everybody for joining us today. Next week, I hope you can join me as I actually do a deep dive and talk more about the cultural boycott against Israel and you don't want to miss that. Um, make sure to sign up for all our discussions and please donate. We are a nonprofit, ccfpeace.com. Once again, ccfpeace.com. We hope to see everyone online. Please, everyone, stay safe. Thank you, Khalil. I appreciate this. Thank you, Aaron. Good to Take be with care. you. Bye-bye.